Knowledge is power. That's knowledge of the future is power over the future and presents the possibility of the potential to control the future. Thus, in the later Shang dynasty, increasingly the Shang king would be telling the spirits what would happen and seeking only the reassurance that the spirits had been informed of his future will. In this way, the Shang king became the chief wizard, the chief shaman, and the chief priest of the Shang dynasty. This role of chief priest or the pontifex maximus of the Chinese emperor would continue throughout Chinese imperial civilization as the Chinese emperor presided over the entirety of Chinese rites, rituals, and culture. Shang divination was principally practiced on tortoises. Here is an example of a tortoise shell inscribed with some of the oldest Chinese writing. Later on, they transferred to using stalks of animal bones like oxen and cows, and also eventually on leaves and other indigenous materials that they could find. Late Shang divination summarizes that every idea, every pattern of thought has a genealogy, and many of the mental habits central to the Zhou and the Han culture of Chinese civilization can be traced back to the ideas and thought of the Shang dynasty. In the grand origin myth of Chinese civilization, Fu Si, the first man, the first Chinaman who survived the last great flood, was said to have heard the resonances of nature audible through the very vibrating medium of the material universe and found these to be manifested on the back of a tortoise shell, emerging from bosom of nature into the manifest and sensible world. During the Zhou dynasty, the practice of divination was further abstracted. Just like we saw in the vases, the cracks that were divined through the cracking of the tortoise shells came to be abstracted into a formal system. And this formal system is best codified in one of the oldest books of the Chinese language, which is the I Ching. Now, the I Ching has a system of hexagrams or trigrams, which are either uniform, full line, or broken line. The full line is meant to represent what would later be understood to represent yang, and the broken line was later understood to represent yin. And if you combine these in multiples of three, you can get a total of eight trigrams. And if you further combine three by three, that is, if you take all the trigrams to the second power, you get 64 trigrams. And the 64 trigrams created the divinatory manual of the I Ching. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this, and one of the things that Leibniz and later Western mathematicians would notice, uh, but the Chinese had known long before, was that each of these symbols is a binary operator. That is, it's either a full line or a broken line, so that it either represents positive or negative. And because it's positive or negative, there's a logical relationship between each of the parts of each of the members, but also one of the members amongst one another, as well as the entire system. And so it allows for a person who conceives of these hexagrams and trigrams to think of them in terms of a system of logical operations that can be applied in different ways in different circumstances. Thus, the system of logical operators in the I Ching, after it had been abstracted from all of the particular instances of sacrificial rites, had come to represent a logic of archetype in which the changes of nature that were evidenced in the sacrifices of the shaman diviners could be understood in their abstract, pure logical relationships. Thus, the I Ching came to constitute the most basic archetypal logic of Chinese civilization, the pure categories of thought and abstract change that could be applied to all particular circumstances. The logic of the I Ching, however, was not conditional, it was not modus ponens, if A, A, therefore B, therefore B, but rather it was correlationist, that is, it was a relation between A and B in which each shared the property C. Javari Cyril writes, In China, where everything that carries meaning is written as a combination of lines, these drawings of the I Ching represent the summit of ideographism. They are able to express the unseen rhythms and movements inherent in every living thing. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel writes in his lectures on the history of philosophy, In the I Ching, thought thus forms the first beginnings of logic, but afterwards it goes into the clouds, and philosophy does likewise. This correlationist logic, already abstract and purified in the I Ching, would come to characterize Chinese civilization as a whole throughout the history of Chinese intellectual tradition. The Zhou dynasty, they overthrew the Shang dynasty, and one of the things they needed to do when they overthrew the Shang dynasty was to legitimate their new royal authority. Previously, the royal authority of the Shang dynasty have invested in the supreme ancestor, which was Shangdi. But since the Zhou kings were not ascended directly from Shangdi, they couldn't claim that legitimacy anymore. They appealed to an even higher power than Shangdi, which was heaven, uh, what they called Ti or Tian. And heaven was meant to bestow upon them the right to rule, which they called the mandate of heaven, which was dependent upon the good governance that they exercised on behalf of heaven. And this required more of it, there was a correspondence between, between the rulership of the state and the natural laws of heaven so that the laws of man were only warranted or justified in as far as they conformed to the natural laws of heaven. Thus in the Tianming, the mandate of heaven, we already see a subordination of the laws of man, the justice of the polity, to the justice and laws of nature, thus a subordination of the activities and affairs of sociality of man to the naturality and operations of the natural cosmos, all of which had been mirrored in the subordination of human affairs to the spiritual and natural affairs that we found in ancient Shang, Shemistic, and divinatory naturalism. One of the curious things about the I Ching is that the creation of the hexagrams was attributed to King Wen, who was the patriarch of the Zhou dynasty. 
It said that he was imprisoned unjustly by the last Shang King, and that while he was languishing in prison, he conceived of how the trigrams of Fusi could be recombined into hexagrams, and that because they were hexagrams, could be expanded into this system of 64 logical operators. And his son would later overthrow the last of the Shang kings, but would die in battle, and so would leave his Zhou dynasty to his, his infant son, who would be ruled over by the Duke of Zhou, who was considered a model of filial piety by Confucius and the Analects. The exponential expansion of the trigrams of Fu Si into the 64 hexagrams of King Wen represents in myth the transition from the Shang practice of sacrificial shamanistic divining to the, the abstract logical system of the I Ching that was used by Zhou diviners. Parallel, moreover, in the abstraction of the authority of heaven to the mandate of heaven over the, the embodied ancestor of Sheng Di. Thus, through myth and legend, we are clued into a grand cultural and religious transition that occurred in the Shang Zhou dynastic transition from the embodied and personal direction of Shang Di, the ruling ancestor, to the disembodied and abstract natural law of heaven, which is manifested in the mandate of heaven, Tian Ming. Amongst the most widely known doctrines of ancient Chinese religious practices and ancient Taoism are those of yin and yang, the opposed forces of active, masculine, and passive, receptive, feminine, which are not mutually exclusive, but complementary and interpenetrating. Yin and yang are respectively said to represent the sunny, uh, shady sides of the hillsides and cool and warm in a complementary opposition that isn't meant to exclude one another, but is meant to transform from one to the next into one another. The characters of the I Ching curiously map along to the characters of yin and yang. As you can see here, the character for yang is almost the same as the character for I. I understand the character for I is meant to represent a combination of characters between the sun and the rain. You can almost see how they depict the sun and the rain. And each of these characters is represented in yang, so we see a combination of sun and rain as though there's a sense of emanation that is a power processing from the sun from yang. And also, these characters can be put together, yin and yang, they each have the same character on this side so that they can be thought of as dancing, coupled together in a single unit. Conjoined by a logical copula, the and between the two terms, so that each together forms a joint logical function, each conditioning the other and vice versa, so that each is mutually interconditioning of reciprocating and cycling interdependence in an endless but mutually complementary cycle of logical inferences. Now all of the hexagrams and trigrams, they're divided and they're conjoined, and this presents the possibility of thinking of them in motion, like a sequence of images in a film. So for instance, yin and yang, as I said, are each combined and separated respectively. But they can also be thought of as coming apart and coming together. And because of this, we can conceive of them in motion as respectively coming apart and coming together in a sequence. And this admits for the possibility of thinking all of the individual trigrams and hexagrams in a motion sequence, and moreover thinking of all of them together in a motion sequence. And one of the neat things about this is you can also think of them, because of their in motion from one to the next, you can think of them cycling around, starting with yang to yin, and then back to yang or vice versa. And this allows for conception of the cosmos as moving in cycles. The cycling of logical operators admits for the abstract and universal conception of the pure forms and necessity that compel the changes of seasons and cycles in natural phenomena. The potential here is clear. From the pure cycling logic of the I Ching, the Chinese devise the possibility of understanding prior to all observations of the changes of the seasons in the calendar and astronomy. And this is something that was very appealing to the Chinese because they wanted to use the divinatory manuals to describe nature as abstract codes or logical forms that could be applied to and therewith understand the seasons and the changes in natural phenomena. Uh, here's one system in which they describe cardinalities of geography in terms of yin and yang. And here's another system in which they describe heaven and earth as cycling through yin and yang. Uh, we're all very familiar with the image of Taoism, And this can also be thought of as cycling, starting with an opposition between yin and yang, expanding, expanding, and then tracking back into another. This was a system of 64 hair hexagrams that was arranged by Shao Yong during the Song Dynasty. And as you can see, it has all 64 hexagrams, and now they're put in a single sequence. So you can see them circling around from beginning to end and coming back to one another, mirroring the sequence of changes in natural cosmology in the seasons of the planet and in the night and day cycle of the body. The pinnacle of correlationist thought concerning the I Ching occurred during the Song Dynasty, during the phase of Confucianism called Neo-Confucianism, in which Confucianism is thought to have brought within it many of the contributory ideas of Buddhism and Taoism. Neo-Confucian cosmologist named Xiao Yong created the Great Wheel, which all of the ideograms of the I Ching cycle from one to the next in a continuous and unbroken and infinite sequence.